Welcome to the Bridge Fellowship Online. We are so glad that you are here, and we hope that this message encourages you today. To find more information about our church or future events, go to tbfonline.net. Hey, I'm Jim, and I'm the Caring Council Pastor here, which means when things are not going well, you call me. And so that's what I do. Um, Ten years ago, we were building on to the Bridge Fellowship. When we first moved here, um, I know that you, we moved out of the West Wilson Middle School. This wall right here was the end of the Bridge Fellowship building, okay? So where there's no G1, G2, G3, and there's also no upper level parking lot. It was just, it was not, there was nothing up there. And it's amazing, you just think, well, that's, that building wasn't too big, and that parking lot was really small. Yeah, it was. That was all we could afford. But I was coming up here one morning to uh, help us move forward in our building project. We had a building meeting, and uh, I live in Mount Juliet, and uh, some of you who know me know that I like to drive a little fast, and sometimes I'm behind for meetings and things like that. So I am, like, tearing it up going down Lebanon Road. I would have been pulled over, maybe jailed in the Lebanon City Jail. If somebody actually caught me coming. But I was trying to get here on time because I hate being late. And as it turns out, there was a car stopped on the side of the road as I was heading to my meeting here. And uh, this was not a nice car. I have driven a 74 LTD, and I have driven an 80-era uh, Chevette, I know bad cars when I see them, okay? Uh, and this was a beater. It, it was dented up, it was messed up, and it was clearly disabled on the side of the road. So I had a choice to make. It's like, okay, uh, am I gonna go and be on my meeting on time or am I gonna stop on the side of the road and help this, and help this person whose uh, car is stopped? And I'm like, man, I gotta go to my meeting. We gotta have more room for people to be here. Uh, this is more important um, I just, I gotta go, so I'm just, I'm just gonna go right on past. So I got about 200 yards past, and not so subtly, this is what I heard going through my head. Are you kidding me? Have you not heard the story of the Good Samaritan? Stop, now. Kept on driving, another 200 yards. No, did you not hear? Stop now, turn around. I'm dumb, but I'm not that dumb. So I pulled a U-turn, very illegal, in the middle of Lebanon Road, and I went back, to the car. What I found in the car was a, a very frantic mom in the front seat, crying, hysterical, and in the back seat was a days old baby in a car seat. I mean, teeny, tiny baby. They were on their way to Vanderbilt, at that time downtown, to, uh, to get some special treatment for this baby who was not okay. There was something clearly wrong. Um, she had called, she had a cell phone. She called somebody to come get her, so I didn't need to provide a ride downtown. I didn't need to do anything except for calm her down and reassure her that everything was going to be okay. You know, I thought about that quite a bit, and uh, I was probably 20 or 30 minutes late from a meeting. We got the building built. Everything was okay. And then I got a, a message probably about three weeks later from the young lady. She said, hey, my, my baby is fine. Everything's okay. Thanks so much for stopping that day. I don't know about you guys. It's just really easy for me to miss it. Um, I, I'm a pastor. I don't know who you think I am, but I'm just like you. And I just, I, there are fundamentally days where I just don't get it. And I just miss things that I need. I miss people and I miss opportunities that I need to be taking advantage of. So, so, so as we talk today, I, this is a familiar story for some of you. But I hope that you'll pay close attention to some of the things we're going to talk about in the story of the Good Samaritan, because there's a whole lot here that is uh, really applicable for our world today, and a whole lot of things that Jesus wants to say to us. So if you would turn, if you've got a copy of God's Word, if you turn to Luke 10, 25 through 29, we're going to read uh, the, the intro of the story of the Good Samaritan, and then we're going to dive all the way through and go through the whole story. Um, if you haven't heard it, it's a good story. Uh, if you have heard it, Maybe you haven't heard it in a way that is uh, really just kind of tears at your heart and soul. Um, it has mine this week as I've studied this, and every time I read it, it hits me a little harder. So now, would you stand with me in, uh, in honor of reading God's Word? Thank you for doing that. That's a custom that we have around here because we always want to hold God's Word high. Beginning with verse 25. Just then, an expert in the law stood up to test him, Jesus saying, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus answers, what is written in the law? How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God 
with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. You've answered correctly, Jesus told him. Do this, and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we, uh, we confess that maybe sometimes we know who our neighbors are, we know how to treat them, and sometimes, Lord, we confess that we, uh, we believe that we love you the way that you need to be loved and want to be loved, and we don't do that all the time either. So God, would you teach us something today that we need to learn from your heart? Prick our hearts, help us to hear something that, uh, that changes the way that we see our world and the people in our world today, and help us, help us see you differently. God, I thank you for every person that's here today, and I thank you for, uh, for the Bridge Fellowship and for the people who, who love and care for me and for this body of believers, and uh, we're just grateful today that you, that you have us here to teach us. We ask you all these things in the precious and powerful name of Jesus. Amen. You may have a seat. All right. I want you to just kind of lock in, okay? So this is hard, Okay. This is all the way hard today, the Good Samaritan. And some of you that are uh, really interested in the Titans game, I'm gonna give you an out, okay? I'm gonna give you out. So the main thing I want you to remember from this, from this message today is this. Love God, love people. Love God, love people. If you got that and you gotta go, you feel like you gotta go watch the Titans lose again, go ahead and do that. That's okay. That's all right. But if you wanna stay, I think we'll prick your heart just a little bit. By the way, my team's kind of getting beat up a little bit too. We're two and two, so. Anyway, so we're gonna have three little basic truths here from the Good Samaritan that I really want you to get. And the first one is this, and it sounds a little harsh as I read it to you, but you'll understand it. Religion is empty of love and mercy. Religion is empty of love and mercy. You know, this man who's talking to Jesus, is, uh, he's not a lawyer in the way we describe lawyers. He's a scribe, he's a Pharisee, he's an expert in the law of Moses. And so he's someone who knows the Old Testament inside and out, and uh, he's, he's trying to discredit Jesus. He's not really trying to ask him a legit question, and you can kind of tell that from the, from the Scripture passage. He's saying, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? So he's thinking that because he's Jewish, he's got it covered. Because just of his lineage, he somehow got the inside track. And then he's asking, he says, what, you know, he's, he's saying, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And in his mind, he's kind of got it all covered. He's just kind of checking boxes here. It's important that this kind of, this discussion is all about something called the Shema. And the Shema is in Deuteronomy 6, and it's basically, uh, there's, there's one passage that talks about the love, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And, and there, he's just discussing this with him. He's just like, okay, let me trap you with this. And so my, my question for me, the question for me this week, and the question I guess I have for you is, do we, do we really love the Lord our God with all of our soul, mind, and strength? And how would we even do that? This is really, really hard just for, uh, for me to even think about. This guy is testing Jesus and asking him these questions, and this is the great I am. This is God in the flesh that this guy is asking questions to, and he's like, and he doesn't even understand it. He is like, man, you could get wiped out in a heartbeat here. Do you know who you're talking to? You're asking God himself, God in the flesh. You're asking him how to love him, and you don't have a clue. You're just trying to trip him up. So how do we, how do we, how do we love God? First of all, you know, the first part is how do we love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength? There's a, uh, a, a really good song, worship song that I love. I was listening to on the way up here yesterday. I had to run up here for a few minutes, and it says, it's a graves into gardens, and it says, God, there is nothing that's better than you. There is nothing that's better than you. And I was thinking about that, about how that challenges me when I think about loving God. It's like, God, there's a lot of things that I really love. I love football. I love watching football. I love adventuring. If you know me, there's nothing I love more adventuring, going to a place I've never gone before. Man, I love, I love oysters. Do you love oysters? Or do you think there's something vile and just kind of... Yeah, I love oysters. I love a lot. I love, I love hardcore, like, 80s rock and roll music. I love a lot of things. But, I, you know, I'm not, I don't think too often about how much, God, how do I love you with all my heart, soul, and strength? So how do we do that? Some practical things. One is that 
you know, we're, we're, we're thanking him all the time for breath in our life. We're thanking him for all he's done for us. We're thanking him for salvation. We're, uh, we're loving people the way, that, we're treating people the way that he wants them to be treated. But we're thankful, we're grateful. And then we, we sing here, which is a part of our worship. We're also worshiping him. I was standing out my yard the other day, late night, late evening, and the moon was rising big on one side and the sun was setting on the other. It was amazing. I was like, God, how in the world can you do this stuff? Do you keep him in your thoughts and mind every hour? Like, God, what are, you, what are you trying to teach me right now? And is there something I need to be doing that's more important than the stuff I'm doing now? I think that's what it means to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And I'm just telling you, if you don't do that well, I don't do that well either. So we're, we're, gonna kind of, we're kind of all in this together. But the scribe kind of checks that. He says, I've already got that. I'm 100% on loving God. He, this guy, he's divisive, he's empty, he's a religious leader, and he's basically saying to Jesus, prove to me that I need you. In fact, I don't believe I need you at all. He's missing the Savior of the world. He's absolutely missing him. And he's much like the two religious experts in the story of the Good Samaritan. And as a matter of fact, I think Jesus dropped the uh, priest and the Levite into the story of the Good Samaritan in an effort to try to get this guy's attention. And I'm not sure that he did. Well, I hope he did. So in verse 30, we go along in the story, and Jesus follows along, and he says, Jesus took up the question and said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of the robbers. They stripped him, beat him up, and fled, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down that road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite, when he arrived at the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. So the story says the priest and the Levite are coming down from Jerusalem to Jericho. A priest is like a pastor. He's like me, Phil, Nolan, Michael, any of our pastors here. He, he teaches in the church and all that kind of stuff in the, in the temple, okay? So he's probably finishing up with church and he's going home. He's going maybe to Jericho. He's going down for a trip or maybe he's going home. And the Levite is someone who's also a church staff member who takes care of uh, you know, everything from like making sure the chairs are set up to making sure we have communion cups to making sure all the rooms are clean. Also, So basically, they're two professional Christians is basically what they're doing, okay? So they're going from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and it's important that you understand the road. Okay, so I need you to get in your mind uh, Monterey, Tennessee, okay? When you leave out of Monterey, Tennessee, and you come back toward Lebanon, what, is, what does the road do? It goes straight down, right? It's straight down. Jericho, Jerusalem to Jericho is the same way, except there are no trees. There's only rocks and kind of desert, but it's the same kind of thing. 1,500 feet in elevation you lose in 15 miles coming out of, coming out of Jerusalem, okay? It is a, uh, a place of, uh, where robbers and bad things happen still today. Um, the people in that area call that road, that 15-mile road, the way of blood, so that tells you a little bit about what that's like, okay? So that's where robbers hang out and, and mess with people, rob people. A lot of murders happen still today. It's a rough, rough place. So the priest and the Levite are heading down that road, and there's a guy laying on the side of the road, bleeding, stripped naked, and just and dying. And they don't know what's going on. But they, they walk on the other side of the road from this guy because they don't want to have anything to do with him. Now, if you've ever been in a big city or been in a city somewhere or somewhere, you know, so there's a homeless person or there's a person who's not in their right mind and they're coming down one side of the road and you're going to meet them. Um, has anybody been like me where you say, okay, I see what's in front of me. I'm going here. I'm going to the other side of the road. I'm crossing the road so I do not have to deal with this person. Anybody done that besides me? Okay, all right. I'm glad I'm not alone. That's what these guys were doing. They, were, they did not want to deal with this situation. And so there are a couple reasons why they might not have wanted to deal with it. One is that they thought there were other robbers around. Those people that did that to him, they wanted to do the same thing to them. And so there's like, okay, I'm not going to get involved in that. Other thing that might have happened was that if they thought he was dead, uh, they would, if a priest or someone who worked in the, uh, in, the, in the temple, if they touched someone who was dead, they were unclean. They were ceremonially unclean. So those are two reasons. The other third reason was, might have been that they just didn't care. They just didn't want to deal with it. They were tired. They were tired of church. They'd done their time. I'm like, I don't need to do this anymore. Now, 
this is a picture of, of a church, of religion without relationship. When you come to know Jesus Christ as the Savior of the world, it changes you. It's not about going to church and checking a box and sitting there and occupying space. It changes your heart and your soul, and it makes you different, right? These guys weren't changed, or they would have stopped. They would have done something. There are two practical applications here for us. One is if you love Jesus and you follow him and believe he's the savior of the world, then it has to change the way that you see people and interact with them. Love is a verb. And here's the other thing. If your love for God must flow into a love for others, your love for God must flow into a love for others. Second part here too, just, just grab a hold of this here. If your schedule is too busy to help someone in need, then you need a different job. You need a different job. You know, we, we've got to have margin in our lives. If your job is, is so intense and so hard that you can't care for other people, that you can't adjust your, your lives, then, man, you're doing too much. You're doing too much. You're leaning over all. Jesus says, don't walk around the hurting. He says, run to them. Don't walk around them, run to them. I have a request of you this morning that's gonna require you to not be involved in religion, but to be involved in a relationship. Relationship with Christ, but also relationship with other people. Uh, we have about 90 people coming regularly on Tuesday nights to regeneration. That's, that's three times as many people as we had coming last year. It's just, it's amazing. And there's a variety of hurts and struggles that people are dealing with. But I need some help. I need some help because we have so many people, we are in need of mentors. Every person that comes to regeneration needs a mentor. Jim, what is a mentor? A mentor is somebody that would, would be a listener and would be an encourager and would be someone that could walk along this path of regeneration with them and help them to not get stuck and keep moving down the process of recovery and freedom, okay? We'll give you some training for that on October the 17th. If you can't come, I'll give you individual training. I've got all kinds of videos. I've got all kinds of stuff to help train you. But I know that I'm gonna need, I've, I've got 15 ladies right now that I know that don't have mentors, okay? And I need ladies who are willing to walk alongside them. Men, mentor men, and ladies, mentor ladies. And what, what that means is uh, taking a, a couple of times a month, spending an hour or so with somebody and just kind of walking through life with them and helping them with this. And again, I'll give you more training. I don't, I'm pretty sure that I have a need for men too, but the guys are like, ah, I'll just wait till the last minute to get them. We got a guy, you know we are. But I need mentors. So here's what we've got on the screen here. This is a QR code, and it takes you to, our, uh, to the TV, church, TBF Church Center app. And so if you've got your phone, hold it up there, and it'll take you to the link for that. But I've already got 10 people who have signed up to be mentors today already. I need some more. I need some more people to be mentors. And so this is going to require you to get to walk, on the other, to walk on the same side of the road with somebody who needs your help. Okay? And I know, you know my inclination is always to go to the other side of the road. I need you to go to this side of the road, and I need you to say, I'm going to practice relationship with Jesus, and I'm going to care for somebody, and I'm going to help somebody I don't know by mentoring them. You say, Jim, I've never done that before. It's okay. We will help you, okay? So if you would do that, I would really appreciate it, and I think you'd be blessed by it. So again, the first, um, first uh basic truth that we have there is that religion is empty of love and mercy. And I really want you to understand this. You can sit here every week and be completely empty until you give your heart and soul to Jesus Christ. And I would beg for you to do that. And I would beg for you then, once he grabs a hold of you, to give your life away. Second basic truth here from the Good Samaritan is this one. And this is also just as hard. Everyone in the world is our neighbor. Everyone in the world is our neighbor. But a Samaritan on his journey, this is Luke 10, 33, but a Samaritan on his journey came up to him, and when he saw the man, the beaten, bloodied, bruised up man, he had compassion. This uh, lawyer, this scribe, he hated Samaritans. And here is Jesus making the hero of this story a Samaritan. 
Jesus, this is the second time Jesus does this. Jesus does it also in the story of the 10 men who were healed. The only guy who came back and asked and thanked Jesus for healing him was a Samaritan. And if you remember a little bit about this, the lady, the woman at the well, she was also a Samaritan. And Jesus came and talked to her when he was not supposed to talk to women or Samaritans. Jews and Samaritans hated each other. Jim, why did they hate each other? They lived in close proximity to each other, but they had entirely different beliefs about life, okay? So the, uh, the Jewish people had the Ten Commandments, the ones that we read about in, in the Old Testament. Um, the, the Samaritans had their own version of the Ten Commandments. They were not the same. They did not believe in the same truth. The Jews thought the place where you go to worship God was Jerusalem. Again, it's elevated. It's a higher mountain. The, uh, the Samaritans had their own place. It was called Mount Gerizim. It was in northern Israel. And they had a temple up there, and the Jews burned their temple on their holy place. These guys hated each other like nobody's business, and they lived in close proximity to each other, okay? Uh, uh, the Samaritans were a mixed-race people. Uh, there, I mean, and the Jews thought they were somehow cleaner or better than them. But man, these people, you know, you think about the world today as a place where there's a lot of hate and discord, you got no idea. This is a hateful, tough, terrible world, and the Jews and the Samaritans contributed to it mightily. A few weeks back, Phil was preaching from uh, Luke 9.53, and uh, he was talking about uh, James and John, the sons of thunder, wanting to burn down a village. It was a Samaritan village that they wanted to burn down. And Jesus was heading to Jerusalem, and the disciples were like, hey, we need to make hotel and dinner reservations because we're, res- we're going to Jerusalem. Hey, can we, we'd like to do this in their town. And the Samaritans said, no. You can't stay here. You're going to Jerusalem, which is the fake holy place, so we don't want you here at all. And James and John are like, let's burn this town down. Samaritans and Jews hated each other. And Jesus steps into that and says to the, to the lawyer, hey, uh, this is the hero of the story here. He's a Samaritan. You would not believe how much fire that lit up in that guy. And Jesus was trying to send a message. He was saying, I am the Savior of the Jewish people, so I'm your Savior, but I'm also the Savior of the Samaritan people. I'm the Savior of every people, and I didn't just come for you small, select group of people. I came for everybody. So when Jesus, when when the lawyer asked him, "Who who is my neighbor? Jesus basically says, I got an answer for you that you don't want. So just for, just for all of us here, I want you to go through this exercise with me, okay? I want you to think about who is the person or the people group that you hate the most right now? Who is it? Me, I was thinking about all the villains in the Taken movies. What about you guys? Who are you thinking, seriously, what were you, who are you thinking about? You know, in our world today, uh, the people that we that sometimes hate the most in the United States are people that don't have the same political views that we have. Democrats, Republicans, socialists. Pick one that you hate. Jesus is speaking into that right now. So who is our neighbor? It's the person that you dislike the most, the people that you hate the most. Who are you taught not to love? I grew up in a home where my mom and dad loved me, but man, they, they raised me to be a racist. They taught me that people that didn't look like me were somehow inhuman or less than human. It's not what Jesus wants for us. Jesus says, hey, everybody's our neighbor. So who, who really is our neighbor? It's everyone who's not like us. It's everyone who believes differently than us. Everyone who looks differently than us. Everyone who lives on the other side of the earth from us, people we've never met, people who have uh, wound up in Nashville from every part of our nation, hemisphere, and planet. There are a lot of people that, have wait, that are here that, man, they just they come from all over the world. The young people at the Bridge House are our neighbors. They need our help. Kids who are homeless, people who are, in, who are trying to find foster homes, those, man, they need our help. They need our help. 
John is doing a great work there. John Widrick, you need to be a part of the Bridge House. The homeless people who will come to Compassionate Hands in, this, this, in Lebanon this winter are our neighbors. They're not just here in the winter, by the way. They're all over town. There's, there's all kinds of homeless camps all over the place. Man, they, those folks are our neighbors. The people who live in the scheme, the place I was talking about in Nidri, the government housing development, they're our neighbors. The people of Nidri Church are our brothers, sisters, and neighbors. That's why we have that group going. That church is uh, probably about 65 people on a good Sunday. They might have 100, but they literally can't do it without us, without our hands. Not just without our dollars. They can't do it without our hands. The people in the, who live in the housing projects around Nidri don't have much in common with us. Their truth is not our truth. That's why the church is there, and that's why we're sending a group. The people of Mombasa, Kenya, are also our neighbors. We're sending a group there on December the, twi- December the 27th. There are lots of Muslim people in that area. Their truth is not the truth of Jesus. That's why we're going. That's why we serve. We don't get to ignore anybody anywhere around the world. We don't get to ignore people in Wilson County. We don't get to ignore people around the world because they're our neighbors. And frankly, if, if Christ followers don't see these people as our neighbors, who exactly are going to see them as our neighbors? We're the light of the world. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. The church is the light of the world. Everyone is our neighbor, including that person that you hate the most. I don't really like that. I don't write this stuff. I'm the messenger. You can come after me. I'm okay with that. I don't write this stuff. Jesus writes stuff that's harder than anything I could ever come up with. This is what he says. Third, third basic truth here from, uh, from the story of the Good Samaritan is that true compassion demands action. True compassion demands action. The story concludes this way. He went over to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine. Remember all this stuff, all this detail here. He went over, pouring on him olive oil and wine. Then he put him on, put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, basically two days, two days of wages, whatever it takes to, if you got paid for working two days, this is the amount of money, he said. He gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. When, he come, when I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. Which of these three proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? And then the Samaritan, and you know he's gritting his teeth when he says this. The one who showed mercy to him, the dang Samaritan, added the dang Samaritan to it. Then Jesus told him, you go and do the same. You go and do the same. The good Samaritan went the extra mile. He could have gone over and checked on him, could have treated his wounds and gone on his way, but he didn't stop there. He bandaged him up, he took care of him, and he put him on his animal, which means he walked either uphill or downhill to wherever this inn was and took him there and then paid for all of his care. He paid for a bed, he paid for food, he paid for his care and said, hey, until he gets better, just keep him here and I'll come back and I'll pay you, for, I'll settle up with you for the rest. Man, there's so much to apply here. You know, as churches and individuals, we need to help people with basic human needs, health needs, food, shelter. When you give to TBF, you participate in that. I want you to know that you do that. We do that with our benevolence. We take care of people who need food. We take care of people who need basic things in life. We pay electric bills, all those things. But I I need you to do something more even than that. I need you to create financial margin in your own budgets to make sure we can help people in need. So here's the question. So in your budget, hopefully you have a budget maybe. Do you have a line item that says helping others? Do you have something that helps others? So if somebody around you, their car breaks, can you help somebody out when their car breaks? Can you help somebody out with buying groceries? Can you help somebody, send somebody on a mission trip if you need to? The Good Samaritan had money he could use to take care of this man. So here's the truth with that. We can't spend all of our money on ourselves. That's not the way of Jesus. He didn't say spend it all on yourself and don't try to take care of anybody else. He said create some margin, take care of people who need help. 
You have to be able to take action. You can't just feel bad for somebody, right? The priest of the Levite could have felt bad for the beaten man, but they didn't stop, and they didn't help, and they didn't act. The good Samaritan offered help, and he delivered it. He took action. Jesus demands action from us. He demands action. Right now, though, I want to flip this story on you just a little bit. You know, normally we think of ourselves when we're in the story, reading the story, it's like we're the good Samaritan and we get to choose whether or not we're going to help somebody who's hurting or whatever else. We're, we're not the good Samaritan. Jesus is the good Samaritan. We are the people on the side of the road who are beaten and bleeding and hopeless. I love all the imagery in this story. Jesus is thinking about what's going to happen to him on the cross and pre cross. Jesus was beaten. He was bloody. All that stuff about pouring wine and oil on the man on the side of the road. Do you remember what happened when Jesus is dying on the cross? They took wine, sour wine, and, and fed it up to him so that it would kind of dull his senses. All the imagery is the story, and Jesus is saying, hey, all these things, this man who's beaten and bloody, I did all this for you. You know, Jesus was, uh, was beaten. He was stripped of his clothing. He did all this, and he did all this for us. He did every bit of this for us. We are the hopeless. We are the ones who've been beaten up. We're the ones that need the help from the Good Samaritan coming down the road. We need Jesus to show mercy on us when there is none. I don't have many of these. I had to actually ask my wife specifically to go get this because I don't usually carry around a lot of these. Everybody see what this is? What is it? $100 bill. Doesn't buy as much as it did five years ago, right? It still buys a lot, right? This, there's value in this. You can go and uh, hopefully you, maybe if you got, depending on how big your vehicle is, this might fill up your car or it might fill up your car twice or if you got, you know, maybe a smart car, it'll fill it up three times. I'm not really sure. But you can go, you can still get a decent meal. You might be able to get some grocery, a good many groceries with this, hopefully. But it's still, you know, it's got value. It's got value. What if I crumple it up and I just mash it up and I decide here, I'm going to throw it on the stage here and I'm going to stomp on it, get beaten up just a little bit. How much is it worth now? $100. All of us, at one time or another, get beaten up. We get bloodied. We sin. We make mistakes. We blow our lives up. We do stupid things. And Jesus says, you still have great value. You I, everybody in this place has great value. Here's the tricky thing, though. All those people we talked about, our neighbors, all those people that we don't like, those people from all over the world, those people that don't look like us, they got great value, too. Why do they have great value? Because they're made in the image of the Most High God. Romans 3.23 says that all have fallen short of the glory of God. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We still have value. That's why Jesus is also back in the book of Romans. It says, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us that we might have eternal life. While we were still sinners, while we were still crumpled up, wrinkled, messed up, stomped on, he died for us. Every person on this planet has value. And Jesus is saying in the story of the Good Samaritan, take action. If you're not a child of the king and you don't know Jesus, I need you to take action today. I need you to come to the feet of Jesus and say, I want to give my heart, soul, mind, and strength all to you. And I want to serve you for the rest of my life. If you already made that decision, that he says, hey, you know, all those people around you, all those people that, that, you know, that you're kind of just walk past every day, I need you to serve them. I need you to love them. I need you to stop on the side of the road and help people that need help 
And I need you to go a long way to help people. I need you to go a short way to help people. I need you to take some time out and spend some time with somebody who's struggling and help them walk through a season where they recover. Don't leave here today without knowing how valuable you are. And you're a heck of a lot more valuable than a $100 bill. Because, not because I said so, because Jesus said so. And love those people that you don't love, that you don't care about. Ask Jesus to help you to love them and care for them because he says they have value. Would you pray with me?